Welcome to Unit 12, Lecture 3 on the Ozone Shield, also known as the Ozone Layer, which we've kind of talked about already a couple units ago when we did the atmosphere, but we're going to look a little more deeply into what it does, how it works, and uh, what has been happening to it over the last 50, 60 years or so. So, the Ozone Layer, talked about that already. It's part of the atmosphere. Keep in mind it's in the stratosphere. And um, it absorbs ultraviolet radiation, ultraviolet solar radiation, or UV radiation. And it is made of a special molecule of oxygen, made with three oxygen atoms, so chemically it's shown O3. Now, the reason it's important is because ultraviolet light is harmful to organisms. It damages genetic material in living cells, so that means it damages DNA and can cause mutations. So by shielding the Earth from the sun's UV light and the UV rays, it acts like a natural sunscreen for the Earth. All right, so that's what the ozone layer does, is it... Um, acts as a, a sunscreen for the Earth, blocking the UV light. Now, the ozone itself, the, the molecules, can end up um, kind of reacting and going away, and, and they, they do this by reacting with another group of chemicals called chlorofluoral carbons, or CFCs, and they are hydrocarbons, which are long chain of, chains of hydrogen and carbon, but the hydrogen atoms that would normally be on the chain are replaced by chlorine and fluorine atoms, which are, are two other elements on the periodic table. So the chlorine makes up the chloro part, chlorine makes up chloro, fluorine makes up fluoro, and then the carbons is like this chain of carbon compounds. All right, now, we use them in everyday life. They are used um, as coolants for refrigerators and air conditioners, most, the most common of which is known as Freon. All right, it's what helps circulate through the motors and uh, the um, condensers of these devices that, that makes the air cold. And we also use them in cleaning solvents. In the past, we used them as a propellant in spray cans, like deodorants, like your Axe deodorants, like insecticides, um, such as like Off or, so, or something like that. We used to use it in hairspray, we used to use it in spray paint. But we've restricted them because we've, we notice they start to destroy ozone molecules up in the stratosphere, and if that ozone gets destroyed, more UV radiation hits the Earth, which is bad. So we kind of tried to stop using so much of these chemicals that destroy the ozone layer because we want to make it better for us as people and for the rest of the planet. We'll get into some of the implications of less ozone as we go along. So at Earth's surface, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, are chemically stable. They don't really react with anything. All right, that's why we used them here. They don't combine with other compounds, they don't combine with other chemicals, they don't break down into harmful things. But when we get them into the high part of the stratosphere, they break apart and they destroy the ozone. So CFCs react with ozone. All right, and as it destroys molecules of ozone, we end up seeing um, depletion in, in ozone up there. So a CFC molecule itself contains anywhere between one to four chlorine atoms. All right, and, and this is the big thing, and, and we've done tests, scientists have done tests to try to, to estimate this, but we've noticed that one single chlorine atom can destroy up to a hundred thousand ozone molecules. 
and one molecule of a CFC contains between one and four. And the, the whole reason for this, if we look down at this, this chemical reaction way down here, now you don't have to memorize the chemical reaction, but if you look at it, here we have a CFC, UV light hits it, breaks off the chlorine. That chlorine goes and reacts with ozone. Breaks off one of the molecules of oxygen from ozone, leaving behind normal oxygen, and making a compound called chlorine monoxide, a chlorine on oxygen. Well, that chlorine monoxide itself can then go react with another ozone. All right, and then the oxygen breaks off the chlorine monoxide. It takes with it an oxygen from ozone, and you release a chlorine atom, which then can go all the way back and start over. All right, and at this step right here, we get a normal oxygen molecule. And at this step right here, when the chlorine monoxide reacts with the ozone, we get two normal oxygen molecules. And then that chlorine can go back and do the process over and 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 over again, destroying lots and lots of ozone. And we didn't really notice this till the mid-80s. We had scientists working in Antarctica, and they, they started noticing, they were studying the stratosphere and the ozone layer. They started knowing that the layer above the South Pole had thinned. It didn't seem as thick, and we used satellite images and ground images to kind of figure it out. And it had thinned by, depending on the measurement, when it was taken, where it was taken, time of year and everything, by between 50 and 98 percent. So that means, like, most to almost all of it was gone. At least half to almost all of it was gone in places. And we started seeing an ozone hole. And this, this hole is the thinning of that ozone. And it actually, we, since then, we've noticed that it occurs over the poles during the spring for that, um, for that pole. So it occurs over the North Pole during our spring right now. And it occurs in, over the South Pole during our fall, because it's the southern hemisphere and the, the um, seasons are reversed. Anyway, after these results but were published in 1985, scientists started to review the data, and they, they w went back and, and used the Nimbus 7 weather satellite, which was launched in the late 70s, and they started seeing the first signs of ozone thinning in 1979. Now, they missed it from 79 to 85 because they didn't know to look for it, but they went back and reviewed that data and saw, hey, this has been happening for a while already. What's causing it? And what they noticed is that the concentration fluctuated over the year, and it was always the least at the, the end of winter and early spring. So, while we saw this fluctuation throughout the year where there would be more in the summer and fall and less in the late winter, early spring, we also noticed that there was less every year than there was the year before, pretty much. And we started noticing the same thing happening over the Arctic, you know, the, the North Pole. And we saw ozone levels... Um, by 97, we saw ozone levels over the northern part of Canada 45% below what we expected that we would expect them to be based on data that we had collected previously. So there, there, there became this, this problem, and we needed a solution. And scientists, governments all over the world, a worldwide group, came together, working together, and brought in some of the top chemical companies to figure out how to present or how to prevent these ozone holes from growing. And so, as of right now, 16, 17, almost 20 years after the fact, 
we are seeing the ozone layer at least stay the same size, the ozone hole staying the same size. The amount of ozone is no longer decreasing. So it's kind of a success story. But why did it take so long? That, that's the big question. All right. Here you can see the hole in 1980, here in 1990, here in 2000. And this is the one over Antarctica and the South Pole. Here you can see South America. All right, so the hole has gotten bigger. The darker the blue, the less ozone there is. So it, it formed during... Uh, the dark polar well it forms because of the dark polar winter so what happens in the winter of the poles there's no sunlight so you get really strong circulating winds and we call this a polar vortex and then the first polar vortex we kind of named it and noticed was one over antarctica because that's where the biggest ozone hole was so we spent most of our time researching there and and this polar vo polar vortex isolates cold air from the surrounding warmer air, and so the air gets extremely cold. And we've noticed this, as we've, we've been saying, the polar vortex has come down from the Arctic and hit us. Over the last couple of years, the polar vortex in the northern and northeastern U.S. has become a buzzword on um, news channels and the weather channel for really cold, bitter, bitterly cold winter temperatures. And as these, with this extremely cold weather, we get very special clouds called polar stratosphere clouds. Now, most clouds, if you remember, exist in the troposphere, right? While well, certain clouds form up in the stratosphere over the Arctic and Antarctic winter and early spring, and that's because air temperatures drop below 80 degrees Celsius, get super cold, and more water condenses. And, and, um, forms ice crystals that form really high up in the air where you normally wouldn't see a cloud form. On the surface of these stratospheric clouds, CFCs get converted to chlorine. So the more CFCs are in the air, the more these clouds form and the more chlorine gets released. Then in the springtime, sunlight starts coming back and the chlorine gets split up into regular chlorine atoms, because chlorine, like oxygen, normally is found diatomically as Cl2, so it gets split up into the chlorine atoms by the radiation, the UV radiation, and then, as we saw a few slides ago, it rapidly destroys ozone. Alright, and so if we destroy ozone, we get a thin little spot, a little hole, and it could last for several months. But we are seeing this change over years. So, the other thing is, if you remember back, we talked about um, air pollution. We talked about ozone being air pollution. And so we're producing ozone down here in the troposphere at the surface. So why isn't that just magically zipping up to the air, to the ozone layer, and filling in the holes? The problem is um, ozone is very reactive. So it breaks down and combines with other substances long before it can reach the stratosphere. So even though we're making ozone down here as a pollutant, it reacts and disappears before it has a chance to get up into that stratosphere. Alright, so ozone layer was thinning. We noticed, we, we realized it was the CFCs, we cut them out, and now we're starting to see the ozone layer kind of remain steady. So it's not increasing in size. The levels of ozone are pretty much staying relatively constant. And we're hoping that as this continues to go on, as we put less and less COC CFCs in the air, we let the ozone layer normally repair itself, and it will eventually get smaller. But what are the effects of this ozone thinning? Well, the less ozone, the less ozone, the more UV radiation is allowed to pass through. All right, it's dangerous because it damages DNA. 
And UV light makes our bodies more susceptible to certain types of cancer, like skin cancer. And it could also cause other damaging effects that we don't know yet. This is why we wear sunscreen. We wear sunscreen to kind of protect ourselves from UV light. And the natural sunscreen that's out there is the, uh, the ozone layer. So here we've got a little graphic. Normally, UV rays come and bounce off the ozone layer, go back into space. But when there's a hole, they pass through the hole and go into Antarctica. Or into the surface, and they can bounce around the surface. Now, we are not the only things that live on this planet. Um, we can also see how the, the thinning ozone layer affects plants and animals. One of the thing, UV light can kill phytoplankton. All right? They live near the surface of the ocean, and what they do is they do... They do photosynthesis. And so phytoplankton are not only the base of a lot of oceanic food change, which will then reduce the number of fish, and we can get less fish from the ocean, which is less food. Also, less phytoplankton means less photosynthesis, so it increases the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Carbon dioxide, as we'll find out in the next few lectures, is a greenhouse gas that kind of traps heat in the earth. So having phytoplankton and other things that take it out of the air, that take out CO2 to make oxygen, it's good for the overall health of the planet. UV light kills these phytoplankton. We also have found that UV light might be a factor in, in the decline of amphibians, such as toads and salamanders. So as we increase UV radiation, we're thinking that it is interrupting the... Um, various life stages of amphibian eggs. And also UV light can damage plants by interfering with photosynthesis, again putting more CO2 in the air. So this kind of sums up, I think you have this in your notes, the, the major effects of UV light. So something to kind of keep an eye on, kind of go through. These things, humans, better chance or increased chance of skin cancer, premature aging, uh, increase of cataracts, which are, are is an eye issue, and even a weakened immune response because our bodies are not used to dealing with all the UV light. Amphibians, we see less survival in eggs um, because the survivor's DNA is getting mutated, getting changed which means they might get changed to the point where they cannot survive. Uh, phytoplankton die for marine life, which disrupts the food chain, reduces photosynthesis, and for land plants, it again messes up photosynthesis and reduces crop yield, so, so the plants are not as healthy. We started protecting the ozone layer in 1987, uh, through something called the Montreal Protocol, which limited the production of CFCs. All right, according to um, certain reports on ozone depletion, many substances have been phased out completely, especially the CFCs and aerosol cans. So go ahead, spray your axe all over the place, stink up your house with that smelly stuff, and um, you're not really hurting the ozone layer. Whereas 20, 30, well, 30, 40 years ago, probably were. Now, we consider ozone protection an international success story because the whole world came together to do these, um, to phase out these, these CFCs. But we, we have to continue to work because CFC molecules can be active for 60 to 120 years, and it takes... 10 years, about, for a CFC molecule to reach the ozone layer. So, 
the CFC molecules that might be interacting with the ozone layer now were actually released 10 years ago in about 2005. So what we're releasing now won't get there to 2025. That's why we've seen this delayed response, why we put all these regulations in place and the hole still got bigger, because there's a 10-year gap, 10-year lag period. We have to wait to see our effects for 10 years. What we've noticed, big part, is the amount of CFCs from developed countries like us has dramatically, well, it dramatically decreased in from the mid-80s to mid-90s. And now we're producing at about the same level as developing countries, which is pretty good. A lot less than it used to be. And uh, that is what is messing up the ozone layer and uh, everything that's going on there. So, as normal, if you have any questions, please bring them in. And have a good night.